how to really have a call sequence and record and how to manipulate all the pointers. So what we are going to assume at this point of time is that I have four kind of instructions. One is call and return, and halt is final stop, and action is the statements which are not the procedure or function type of statements. Okay? So these are like the signings or Boolean flow, uh, control flow, and so on. Okay? And we don't have to worry about this, but important part is really the call and return. So if you look at static allocation, now what we have to do is allocation and deallocation is going to occur as part of the procedure call and is going to be part of the return sequence. That is why I have to manipulate all the addresses. So let's assume two functions. One is C, another is function P, and C is going to invoke P by having a call statement, and then P will return control, which will go back to the beginning of action 2. And action 1 and action 2 are some pieces of code which do not concern any procedure innovation and they are just going to be some state type code. So what we also have is that we have activation report corresponding to C, we have activation report corresponding to P, and we are assuming that it takes, this takes 60 bytes, this takes 64 bytes, these are some addresses. So this is really the Relative address starting from here and goes up this from 0 to 60, this goes from 0 to 80. And as I said, these numbers are some arbitrary numbers which will depend upon the local variables, parameters, and so on. Okay. Now, what we have to understand here is that when I now say that I am trying to make a call to P, okay, how do I manipulate the data in this? And when I say I return, then where I should jump. And the code is going to be in this sequence. Okay. So let's make certain assumptions and as I said, at this point of time, I'm first dealing with static allocation. Okay. So all statement is going to be, in this case, a <coughs> sequence of actually two instructions. I'm manipulating my return addresses. I have to move instruction to save the return address. So for example, what I need to do is when I say call P, okay, I need to go to the activation of P and fill in the return address. Now, what is the return address? Return address is going to be from the beginning of this. So when I call P, control goes here. When control comes back, it's not at the same point, but at the instruction which is next to call. Okay. So this is what we do, that move instruction saves the return address. And then a go to is going to transfer control to the target code. That means that when I say call P, first thing that will happen is that this return address has to be saved here. And then I will say that jump to beginning of wherever the code is. This is the data area and this is the code area, so that is where control will jump. And when I say that return, then I am going to jump back to this address okay, and resume execution from that point on. Right? This is what jump, uh, this is what jump to the procedure is. Okay? So what is the call instruction now? It's a sequence of two instructions. The first instruction is I am moving and I am saying move whatever is the current location plus 20 to the call is back, okay? And then I say jump to the calling code area, okay? Now we have to understand what this 20 means, okay? So we have put here some number 20. What does this 20 mean? How, how I am getting this number 20? So I made certain assumptions here. And the assumption here is that each of code is going to take 4 bytes, a word, and each address is also going to take 4 bytes, okay? That means if I start counting okay, how many words this instruction will take, this instruction will take one word for this opcode, one word for this address, and one word for this address. And similarly, this will take four bytes, and this will take four bytes. So total, if you count, I take 20 bytes here. Okay. So whatever is my current address where move is going, then the jump return address has to be instruction which is next to this, which is going to be current address plus 20. That is how I get 20 here. So this is what we do, and then we say that all the static area and the static area of the calling code are constants because I'm talking about static allocation. I'm not doing any stack allocation at this point of time. Okay. So they refer to address, and therefore, if I look at this, this is where I have to fill in the return address. Okay. So what this move instruction is doing is is saying that store this address into the calling static area, and calling static area is obviously the address of the activation report of the first number. Okay. So 
let me straight away go to the code and really put certain numbers. So let's assume that each action is going to take 20 bytes and start address of the code address of C and P is 100 and 200. Okay? And activation records are statically going to be allocated in the locations 300 and 364. Okay? So since I'm doing everything as static allocation, these numbers are known to be at the file. So how will my code look? Code will look something like this. Okay? That I have this code corresponding to C, code corresponding to P, data area of C, and data area of uh, data area of P and data area of C. So what do I do now? So if you look at this instruction, it says move 142 364. So what this is saying is that whatever is my current address plus 20, that gives me 140. I'm going to store that into 364, which is the activation record of P. Okay. So I'm going to store this address, which is really the return address, so that when this activation returns control, control will jump to 140. Okay. And then at this location, I'll say now jump to 200. And what is the 200? 200 is the code area of the procedure being called. And when return happens, what will return say? Return is saying go to the address which is stored in 364. And what is 364? 364 is the first address of the activation of P. Okay. So now when I say go to 364, I already stored 140 here. That means I will jump back to 140 and will resume execution from here. Okay. So let's go back to this point. So basically what we are saying is that the calling static area and the calling code area are the constants which refer to address of activation of the first address of the procedure code area and the data area respectively. And then we say here plus 20 is the move instruction which is the return address and address of the instruction which follows the go to. Okay. And a return from procedure is implemented by this saying go to the indirect calling static area. Everyone knows this what the star operation is. The star operation is basically saying jump to the location whose address is code in this particular location. Okay. So this is how my overall code is going to look. Okay. So this is how I fill in all my return addresses and this is how I implement job. Of course, okay, I have not put instructions here. So we discussed also instructions for how to save machine status. So for example, what I do here is that actually when I say move this, this is only saving the return address. So after this, I will also have to have instructions for setting up activation record which we discussed. Uh, no, sorry, instructions for setting up all the access links, which we discussed yesterday. And we'll also have to have instructions for having the allocation of local variables, okay, which are all going to be okay. okay. Is this part clear? What we are doing here? So static area is, static allocation is fairly straightforward. I know all the addresses at compile time. I only have the layout of activations. And once I fix all these addresses at compile time, I can start the instruction. Okay. You can also see that what it also means is that when I'm talking about all these addresses starting from 100, what this means is 100 is the base address, which is relocatable address. And when actually code gets loaded in memory and gets executed, all addresses will be changed with respect to this base. Okay. So when I say 140, this is with respect to base. And if this base changes to some other location, then obviously this will also change. Okay? But that normally through base register, OS is going to take care of the execution. <laughs> Any questions on this? This part here? Yes, no? So what I need to also do is when I say that I have this call here. So I have implemented call through two instructions. One is that storing the return address and then jumping to the code area. But actually call is a sequence of several more instructions. So one is to create access links, one is to save the state of the instance. Okay? That means I'll also have to have a sequence of instructions here, which will say move register R1 to certain local area, move register R2 to certain local area and so on. Now I'll have to decide which registers to save. So suppose I have eight registers and I want to save that in the activation here. So I also have to have these instructions before I jump to 200 and start executing it. I will have instruction here which will say that save all these into the temporary locations which are part of this activation. And similarly, when I say go to this, before this go to, I will also have to have instructions which will say that move all the data which I saved here back into the registers. So I will have to 
say the machine status and we will have to restore the machine status. So this restoration will be done by Kali or Kali? Shall we go back to what we did in the... So who does it? Static allocation. Now let's come to stack allocation. So what is going to happen in stack allocation is that I will have some code area. So this is all the code of the main program and of all the functions and procedures. Okay, and I also have now what I can assume is that even for the main programs, okay, my stack suppose may start from here, and this is the static data, okay, or the global data. And this is how my stack will start to So first thing I need to remember here is that what is my stack pointer. Okay? Now normally what we do is there are normally two pointers maintained, but let's work with one pointer for the time being. Okay? And that one pointer is the stack pointer. And the stack pointer is to begin with maybe here. And then I say that activation is on top of stack pointer. Since I know the size of activation record, okay, or in this case global data, I can always find out with respect to the stack pointer, where is the offset. So I also need to therefore remember that what is the location for which I will start loading my stack. Okay. So what we do here is that position of activation record is not known until the runtime. Until your program is executing, I will not know where in memory this activation record is going to come. Because depending upon the call sequence, this activation will be anywhere. Okay. Because also remember that we are not dealing with recursion and so on. Okay. So position is going to be stored in a register. So I'll have some location where I'll say that what is my stack pointer and that value has to be stored. There. And at runtime, then I have to manipulate this stack pointer. So what will happen is that I'll say initially this may be my stack pointer, then I load data here. Okay. Now with respect to this stack pointer, I can find out all the variables here. And now when a new activation comes, then I have to increment my stack pointer by saying that stack pointer plus size of this activation becomes the new value of the stack pointer and a new activation comes here. Right? So this is how my stack pointer we keep manipulating. I only have to initialize it once. Okay? So this is what we do that before I even start executing my first function, I say that some start address from where the stack will start, start loading is stored into the register which is SP or stack pointer. Okay? And this is really the fault instruction. So what we do is that every time I push an activation, I manipulate my stack pointer to say that stack pointer gets incremented by the size of the activation. And when I return, the reverse action has to take place where I say that the stack pointer gets decremented by the size of the activation. Right? So now what happens here is I say that all sequences now increments stack pointer, save return address, and transfer them control. So this is the new thing. Earlier, I was just saving the, in static allocation, I was just saving the return address and I was transferring control. But now I also have to increment my stack pointer. So how will my instructions look? I'll say that add to stack pointer the caller record size. Okay? So assumption here is that the stack pointer is at the bottom of the caller activation. Okay? And then I say move here plus 16 into the location which is pointed to by stack pointer. That means into the location, once I have implemented this, this is where the first location of the activation is. And that is where I store my return address. Okay. So same strategy as I was using earlier, that return address is always in the first location. In this, okay. in this case, since I do not know the absolute address, I refer to that location by SP. But here now, instead of 20, I am doing 16. So how did I get this number 16? Okay. Again, same assumption that each opcode and each address code is taking 4 bytes. But in this case, since this is a register argument, I need only 4 bytes for this opcode, 4 bytes for this address, 4 bytes for this opcode, and 4 bytes for this address. That gives me 16. Okay. I don't have to count now bytes for register. That's a register argument. Okay. So this is 
now my call set sequence and what will be my return sequence? Return sequence is just saying that go to whatever is pointed to by stack pointer with an offset of 0. So this is standard thing. Okay. What we say here is that we may remove this 0 or we may just keep it but basically this is saying that if in just in case my return address is somewhere else, okay, then I can use Z, that value here. But basically this is saying that whatever is the location pointed to by stack pointer, that is where my control has to go by. Okay. And obviously then you have to subtract from stack pointer whatever is the color size of the activation. Okay. So how will my code now look? Okay. So let's go back to the quick sort program we discussed yesterday. So in quick sort I had this sort program, then I had q sort. So sort was the main program, then I had q sort and exchange in partition and so on. Okay. So we can make certain assumptions here that the size of activation records are if I say sort, partition and quick sort, they are given by numbers S size, P size and Q size. Okay. And this can be determined and combined. Because for each activation I know how many bytes I need to create that activation. I may not know the location because of allocation, stack allocation, but at least I know the sizes. Okay. So these sizes are known to be a compiled time. And first word of each of these activations is going to hold the return address for me. That is what I am going to return, reserve for the return address. Okay. And we also assume that the code area, in the code area, the procedures they start at 100, 200, 300 and stack starts at 600. Okay. So these are some <coughs> numbers I have assumed. Okay. But all this information I know is going to be available to me at compile time. What I will not know is that in which order I am going to push the activations and therefore that code has to be generated as part of my call sequence. Okay. So how will my code look? So let's say that code looks something like this, that in the main program for sort, I make a call to quick sort. So there may be some action here, okay, which is non-procedural action. Then I have a call to Q and then I have another non-procedural action and then I stop here. And in P, okay, so which is partition, I just take some actions and return. And in case of quick sort, I have some action, then I have a recursive call to P, then some more action. Uh, so in this, I have a call to P and I have two recursive calls to so when I call quick sort, I will first make a call to partition and then I will make two recursive calls to Q. Okay. I am not worried about parameters here. I am only interested in setting up how to have return addresses be pushed as part of the activation. Right? So this is how my pre-address code looks. But when I go to the machine kind of code, okay, let's understand what this is doing. Okay? So first thing we say is that since my stack starts from 600, I push that value into the stack pointer. I store 600 into the stack pointer. Okay. Now, who determines what this 600 is? Who is going to decide this number 600, whether this is 500, 600, or 1000? So, compile. It's not worse. Since I am generating relocatable code, okay, <coughs> I know that this is the total process space which has been given to me, and I decide that for this program, is sufficient that I know I have done code generation, I know how much code and data area is there and I can start loading my address from, uh, loading my stack from certain location. Okay. Actual address of 600 will map down, will be mapped on to, depending on the page table will be, get mapped on to some other address. Right. So this is the total area which has been given to my program and I am generating code only for this one. Okay. So I move 600 to stack pointer then I have this action and then I say that add now, since this is going to make a call, this is I am saying that add size of s to stack pointer. So my stack pointer gets incremented, and then I say move here plus 16 into the location which is pointed to by stack pointer. So I move 152, which is 136 plus 16, which is here. That is where the control will come, and then I say jump to location 300, and 300 is this location okay, where I make call to Q. Okay. So where will this return address get stored? So return address will get stored into, if this is what my code area is, so let's say that this is my code area, then stack pointer started pointing to the first location here, okay, and then this is where I stored value of, uh, what is the value I stored, 150. This is where my return address, okay, but look at the code corresponding to this part, okay. So what happens here, in this part, okay, I am saying that now I am going to make call to, first I am going to make a call to P. So what I do is, I say that 
take size of q and push that value into the stack pointer. So I am now going to say that this is the activation corresponding and then the next activation has to be pushed here. So again, so sp has to be incremented, so sp will go here. So this is i increment by the size of the caller and then I say move 344 into the location which is pointed to by stack pointer and what is 344? 344 is 328 plus 16, that is where the control has to come back. Okay? And then I say now jump to location 200 and 200 is the code area corresponding <coughs> to the key. Okay. And what does this do? This always says when it, whenever a return happens, a return happens by looking at whatever is my current stack pointer and the address which is stored in the location at an offset of 0 which means the first location of my activation jump to that. So whatever address I stored there and every time this address could be different depending upon the call sequence. Okay. But doesn't matter what the address is, I am only jumping, making an indirect jump saying that whatever is the address which is stored in this location, jump to that location. And every time you will see that in this case I am <coughs> storing 344 here, in this case I am storing 390. So when I now make a recursive call here, I am going to say that increment now this by two size once again, move 396 which is 380 plus 16 into the stack pointer and then jump to 300. So 300 is now a recursive call coming to the beginning of this procedure. Okay? And once the control comes back, control will come back to this location which will say that now subtract this part and then continue execution from here. When I come to 424, then again I am going to add two size to SP and then I say move 448 which is 432 plus 16. Okay? I store this location, jump to 300 which is a recursive call and when the control comes back, I come here and finally I jump return from this procedure and what is the value which is stored here? That value must have been initialized at this location. Okay. So there is a code I need to generate and you can see that this code, this is the code really now which is managing our runtime. So irrespective of what my call sequence is and what is the value which is going to be returned by partition, this code is going to remain the same. Okay. Only, only thing that will happen is that if you look at this action 5 and action 6, they are going to determine whether I am going to make a recursive call here or I am going to just fall through and not execute this recursion and straight away jump to this. So it will say that if partition returns a value which is smaller than the bound or is equal to one of the bounds, then I don't make a recursive call, but I just return. Okay. But that is irrespective of whatever the code is. Code will look something like this. Okay. So many times people confuse between uh, what the stack pointer, where stack pointer is pointing to. So what you need to sort of remember is that stack pointer always points to from where the stack starts and activation is on top of stack pointer. Now normally for efficiency reasons what we may do is that if I look at some activation record, my SP may be here and I may have an additional pointer here which sometimes you will find that is called a fail pointer and then I can access data within this activation either with respect to stack pointer or with respect to frame pointer. And what is the difference between stack pointer and frame pointer? If I say SP minus SP, what will it be? It will be the size of activation. Okay? Then why do I need another <coughs> pointer? The advantage sometimes is that if this activation record becomes large, then some data could be accessed very quickly by looking at an offset with respect to FP and some data which can be accessed very quickly by looking at an offset with respect to SP. And I want to keep offset as small as possible. So now it should also give you a hint. If you go back now <coughs> to what I did in my activation record, okay, the data which is frequently accessed is either going to be here or is going to be here. Okay. So for example, if you notice that I have this local data and so this is where I set machine status in the middle. Okay. Now when do I need machine status? Machine status I need only when the call returns, not during the execution of the function. Okay. But any data I need during the execution of the function is kept close to one of the pointers and the reason is that this data is accessed much more frequently therefore I should be able to access this more efficiently as compared to this data. So if this activation becomes large then I want all frequently accessed data to be close to one of the pointers and what is the advantage? That I will be able to access the data with a very small offset that means not only I will save few bytes of my memory 
but I also have a faster axis. Uh, you remember assembly language programming? Hmm? So if you remember assembly language programming, and when you say that I have this instruction which says jump to a location or access a location, and that offset is small, which I can fit, say, say offset is up to 8 bytes. Okay? Then I will take only 3 bits to fit into it. Okay? Now if offset becomes very large, then I may need an additional byte to put that offset value. If this is small, then it can be part of the same instruction and it will actually save a byte for it. And normally these small offsets are kept in registers and these instructions are much faster. So just go back and look at the difference between small offset and large offsets. Okay? It stores the whole instruction in fewer bytes and therefore becomes much faster to access. That's the difference. It's something which hardware provides. Okay? And what we'll try to do all the time is that we try to exploit whatever <coughs> hardware gives me, we will have a code which is much faster. So are we not confident about how to do code generation for procedures? So now you can see that what I'm showing you is complete code for three address code for or actually in this case happens to be almost the machine code <coughs> procedure. Okay. So procedure handling therefore is, I mean the reason I treated procedure handling separately from straight line code and so on was that we need to worry about initializing all the data into the activations and all the return sequences and filling in all the addresses. But you can see that all this is done by compiler. Okay. So compiler only makes sure that I generate enough code so that it can execute. Okay. I don't depend upon, so this also is part of my runtime system, but I don't depend upon OS or anyone to generate this code or fill in these addresses. Also. So now we have seen everything. We started with straight line code and we went all the way up to procedures and functions. Okay. And we see how to pass parameters, we know how to create access links, we also know how to create now links to the control structure that means either lexical scoping and dynamic scoping and how to manage my runtime system. Okay. So what is the next thing in code generation? One thing we have not still touched upon and that is how do I generate code for dynamic data structures. <coughs> so far we have not talked about when I say that <coughs> give me some locations of memory, how do I manage the heap space there. Right? This is my stack space but he will go from here, I need to have code for that. Okay. Again, this is the area which is provided to me by OS and I have to manipulate this area. I must have enough code to manipulate this. So this is all part of the file. So that is the next thing that we want to look at what I want to do with my dynamic storage facility. Okay. How do I manage this key? Any questions uh, up to what we have done for procedures before I move on? <coughs> this procedure part here. Okay. So, this storage is usually going to be taken from E, which is coming as this part and we will start going from this end. Okay. And this is what we want to see, part of it we saw yesterday. So, we are going to allocated data is going to be retained until this is going to be deallocated. Okay. And allocation can either be explicit or implicit. Okay. So, when I say that, if we look at languages where I say that Explicit allocation, I'll have this call like new, I'll have this call like dispose, okay? And if you look at all object-oriented languages like uh, C++ whenever or Java, when you say that I create an object at that point of time, space gets allocated or in C, I'll say malloc and so on, okay? So I have explicit calls, okay? But then there are languages which are really working at the level of, which are list-like language, uh, list -like languages. They'll say that whenever I construct the data, I don't have to really make a call. It is going to automatically allocate and automatically deallocate. Okay? So there is an issue like garbage collection which comes here, which is not part of this class of languages. So people also work on saying how to how can I do garbage collection in C. So you may leave certain pointers which are just hanging, which are not being used in C also, and you may end up wasting space. So some people have also tried to build the garbage collector with C. Okay, but uh, we'll only touch upon it and not go into details of this. Okay. So let's see what are the kind of things which may happen, what are the kind of problems you may face while managing my dynamic data structures. So take typically a linked list like this. Okay. So this linked list has some data and then it has pointers and the last pointer is pointing to null and then I have a pointer which is pointing to 
ahead of the link list, okay? And the calls typically I may have is that I may create now a new. Now, in malloc, I mean, what happens is that you can say that give me enough space for creating this kind of data structure. Here I am saying that create now a record and it will determine from the record layout how much space to be given here. And then I can say p hat p is going to be k and p hat intro is going to be i. So these are typical calls of initialization which are same in our languages. Okay. Now what I may do is that I may create unreachable sets. Okay. So what I may do is I may decide that I want to dispose of this pointer or initialize this pointer to null. Okay. Now as soon as I initialize this pointer to null and there is no other pointing pointing to this part of the list, what will happen? Okay. This cell and this cell becomes in an error system. Okay. Now as far as user is concerned, user space is concerned, I still have this cell allocated, but this is not accessible, so actually I'm wasting space. Okay. Now many people have this notion saying that oh, today memory is not a problem, I have 4 GB of virtual address space and therefore I can just keep on doing malloc and not have a worry about disposing it off or releasing it or freeing it if you just want to be precise on the C syntax. Okay? That's a very dangerous thing to do because over the time what may happen is if you have a large program running, imagine operating system running and operating system is continuously doing malloc for various processes and never releases memory. What will happen? Very quickly you will run out of whatever space is available. Okay? So, you can create unreachable cells okay, which are not accessible. So if I say head out next is assigned nil, okay, and this assigned is nil, then these two cells are still in memory. Then they are not part of the free space, but they can also be not allocated to any other program. Okay. And I may also create dangling references. Okay. So I may just say that dispose of this cell. Now when I say free this particular cell, what will happen? This pointer is pointing to some arbitrary location. This is a tangling pointer now. It doesn't point to anything, okay, which is equally dangerous. Okay. And in fact, if I just dispose it off, not only I have created a dangling reference, I have also created a garbage. Okay. So now there are languages which will manage your storage so that even if you create dangling references and garbage over the period, they will clean up the space for you. Okay. But there are languages like C, and this class of languages will not do any such thing and you will run out of memory. So explicitly programmer has to manage part of it. But therefore, we need what we need to manage is that where do I store this and how do I manage my heap as compiler right. Okay? I cannot implement, I cannot enforce programmer discipline, but as compiler I need to make sure that whatever is provided by the language I efficiently implement that part. Okay? So first thing is explicit allocation of fixed size blocks. I gave you a glimpse of this yesterday. But basically what we are doing is that we are saying that blocks are kept in a list. So I'm talking about a fixed size block. So this is saying that for some small number, I can say, if I say allocate 400 bytes, I'll say, don't worry, I'll give you always one fixed size of block. Okay. So what we can do is allocation and deallocation can be done with very little overhead. And what is that? All I'm saying is that I have an available list where I have a linked list of available blocks to me and then these are the parts which have been allocated and now if I say I want to free this particular cell, I want to deallocate this cell, this becomes now part of the available list and this part still remains allocated. So you can see that overhead of managing a fixed size block is very small. Okay? I just need to have a linked list of available blocks and then I can just do allocation and deallocation. Allocation and deallocation only means that I need to either put it in the list or I remove it from the list. Okay. So this is hardly any overhead. This really does not put too much of pressure on us. Okay. And continuing on this, so blocks are going to be drawn from contiguous area of storage. That means as far as this block is concerned, this is still going to be continuous in memory. I will not say that this block of 1K will take 256 bytes from here and the remaining 784 bytes from somewhere else. That kind of thing will not happen. Okay. So blocks are drawn from continuous area of storage and the area of each block is used as part of it obviously is pointed to the next block. Okay. And then I have this pointer available which points to the first available block in this. Okay. And allocation means removing a block from the available list and deallocation means putting the back block back into the available list. Okay. Now compiler routine, now remember that what I am doing here. I am writing part of the program 
which is going to manage my deed. That's also a program, right? I have to make all the declarations there. Now, when I allocate space, okay, when I say that I have this linked list, okay, what is the type of data I declare for this linked list? I need to declare that, right? So right, imagine writing a C program which manages this linked list. Or imagine writing a program in any high level language. Okay. What is the type of the record I declare? Why area of cache? I don't know whether I'm what I'm going to store there. We're talking of C, right? Suppose I have much more strongly typed language than that, like Ada or Kafka or Elgo. Then, not permit me to do that. So normally what we do is, as far as runtime system is concerned or the heap manager is concerned, <coughs> it actually need not know what is the type of this. So I can just use variant reports. Right? You can see this is union type and every language permits you to have variant report where type is not fixed. Okay? And when I actually allocate it and goes to the program, programmer is going to determine what type of data they are going to store there. Okay? So as far as heap manager is concerned, heap manager doesn't care what is the type of this. Okay? So it's just a variant kind of structure which is called. Okay? Now, interesting situation comes when you have a variable size of it. Okay? Again, you have to worry about best fit or first fit. Okay? So storage can become fragmented over the year, uh, over the time, and situation may come when program allocates <laughs> some box and then deallocates some of them. So I may have this fragmentation going on that I allocated somewhere and then this becomes free. And now if I say that I want a block of say size which is larger than all of these, then I'm stuck because I'm looking for a continuous block. So I also need to defragment. So fragmentation is of no consequences if blocks are of size fixed. Okay? Then it doesn't matter. If I'm fixed sizing block, I just maintain a linked list, doesn't matter where the next pointer is, that is not an issue. But fragmentation becomes very important when it is variable size blocks. Okay. So now I also have to see that how do I, if I find that, suppose I have a free space here and I have free space here, and how do I merge the two spaces? If they are consecutive to each other, then merger is straightforward. Okay. But if they are not consecutive to each other, then what I need to do is, I need to move this, so assuming that this green part is the allocated space, I need to move this here, I need to move this here. Okay? And what does movement involve? So what does movement mean? So suppose this is a task in front of you, okay? that I have these, so assume that the smallest unit is a byte. Okay? And I want to make sure that this data, remember that once I move it here and I move it here, okay, movement just does not mean that I will change the base address. It means something else, that I may have pointer here. I may have a location which is actually pointing to some other location. So what I need to know is that if it is pointing to say location x and that x moves, now everything which is pointing to x should now start pointing to the new location where x is going to be. I must know what my pointers are. That means when I say that I have some allocated space, within this allocated space, I should be able to track what my pointers are and what are not my pointers. Okay? So I need to worry about when I say defragmentation. Has anyone done ever defragmentation on a hard disk? If you run this program for defragment on hard disk, yes, what happens is when there's a pictorial representation which comes in so on. So how do you think a hard disk defragmentation will manage all, so suppose I mean you're working on Unix system or I mean this is your file system, then all the file pointers must be correct, right? So all inode structure should not be destroyed and so on. So somebody knows in some table that where all my inode addresses are and when I move this particular block into another block, then the inode table must go back and change all the information there, right? So similar thing we will do here and we'll shortly come to this. So block cannot be allocated even if space is available because I may need larger space and because of fragmentation, I must know the fragmentation. Okay? So allocation of first fit method is that search the first three block which is of size greater than this. Okay? So 
best fit pattern is I am looking for a block which is of size just greater than this. First method is that I start looking at this and there will be another other method usually which will say that look at the largest block or there will be another method which is saying that after allocation the remaining block should not be smaller than certain size and so on. Okay? So you can think of various strategies here okay? and then allocation means that I look at some block which is of size greater than this and then subdivide this into two parts S and F minus S and time overhead of obviously there is now time overhead of searching for a free block. Okay? So earlier in the fixed size allocation there was no overhead. I have only overhead was that there was one pointer that I was saying that pointer points to the first block in the available list and I just change that pointer to the next one and everything was done. But here I have to have an overhead of finding out the available block. Okay? And when block is deallocated, what is done? I check whether this is next to a free block and if it is next to a free block then I just combine it. But if it is not next to a free block then I have to go to defragmentation. Okay? So implicit deallocation is it requires now. So when I say implicit deallocation, implicit deallocation is equivalent to either garbage collection or over the time or defragmentation. Okay? Now this requires some cooperation between the user program and the runtime system. Okay? And what kind of cooperation is required? Now I need to know two things. I need to know what are the blocks which are no longer in use. Now how do I find out a block which is no longer in use? So, okay, think about it, but shortly I am going to ask you this question once again. Okay? And this by implemented by fixing the format of the storage block. That means I just cannot say that I get a block and I put some data here. Okay? User program has to make sure or my runtime system has to make sure that the data which is put here has certain structure. And what that structure may be? It may now have a structure saying that I have user information, but I will also say that what are the pointers to other blocks? So when I say user information here, it may have some entries which actually are pointing to some other blocks. There are some pointers. Okay? Now I want to keep all these pointers separately so that when I start defragmenting, okay, when I start deallocating, I need to worry about what these pointers are pointing to. Because if I don't have this information, I will not be able to manage. Okay? Then I also have certain markers which will say that whether this block is in use or not. And I may also have a reference count saying that how many other blocks are pointing to this particular block. Okay? So I need a lot more information than just user information if I want to manage all these deallocations. So I will have information like block size. So this will say that if I know the first address, then I know the boundary here. Okay? See, I mean, think from the point of view of the hardware and what happens there. I mean, you just say that you have certain memory locations and each memory location is nothing but a bit Okay. But if I know that this is the beginning, this is the pointer to the first location and I immediately know the size, then I can find out what is the size of this particular block. And by having this extra information saying that how many blocks, whether it is in use or not, how many blocks are pointing to this and what are the blocks it is pointing to, that is the one which helps me doing allocation and uh, which helps me doing deallocation and defragmentation. Okay? Now once I have this information, okay, suppose I have this information, this is how I have laid it out. How do I deallocate? Can you think of a strategy now that how will I be okay? I'll do it. No, don't worry about it. Though. Suppose that I have all these blocks somewhere in my heap, okay, which are lying, and I just need to know only one thing that is the first block in use. If I know the first block in use, that will have a pointer to everything. So, what I can do is I can mark that all my blocks are not in use, and then I can say that the first block is in use. So I change the marker to that okay, and say that this is in use and then I say whatever it is pointing to, I go to those blocks and mark them also as used and if I continue this traversal, then I will mark all the blocks as used and whatever is not used, whatever the marker has not been marked, that is now can be deallocated. Right? So one way to look at this is that, uh, so somebody actually gave a very nice uh, pictorial representation. I remember seeing the video of this, I uh, animated data structure. Okay? So, I mean here, I mean if you assume that every pointer is, uh, every link is just a pipe, okay. So, you go to the first block and pour some color uh, into this, color liquid into this and it is flowing over to all these pointers and wherever it does not reach. So, whatever block is co colored, 
that is in use, whatever is not colored, that is no longer in use, and the allocate those. Okay. So that means we have lost pointer to all those locations, and therefore there is no need to keep all this information. So recognizing block boundaries. So now let's look at all each of these. Okay. And the first thing we say is that if block is of size fix, block is a fixed size block, then the position information can be used. Otherwise, keep size information will come into block boundaries because that is how you say that. This is where my block ends. Okay. In case of linked list, I use this was the fixed size. Okay. And when the block is in use, okay, so reference may occur through a pointer or through a sequence of pointers. There may be multiple pointers. And compiler need to know position of all the pointers in the storage. And pointers can be kept in a fixed location, and user area does not contain any pointers. So basically, this part, okay, this is where I'm saying that I'm keeping all the pointers here. So basically, in this user information, I know that what are my locations which are pointing to something else. Which are pointed. See, I mean, otherwise, I cannot differentiate between a bit pattern whether this is an address or this is an integer value or some other data structure. Okay. So I need to explicitly know what my pointers are, so that when I start moving other blocks, then I know that this is these are the locations which need to be changed. Okay. So this is where I say that whether block is in use. Okay. And what is the reference count? It keeps track of number of blocks which point directly to this present block. Okay. So every time some pointer is disposed in one of those blocks, then I need to come back here and change my reference count here. And whenever this reference count becomes zero, then I know that this is not being pointed to by any other block and is ready to be disposed of. Okay. And if count drops to zero, then block can be reallocated and maintaining reference count is going to be possible. Because every time I do an assignment like this, which says Q is P is assigned Q, then what is happening here? that whatever Q was pointing to, so if Q is a pointer, whatever it was pointing to, it will no longer point to that. So not only wherever Q occurred, okay, all those have to be deallocated, or the reference counts of the blocks which are pointed to by Q, they have to be decremented by one. But here, we say that since Q is assigned to P, okay, then I now know that P will start pointing to everything which was being pointed to by. Okay. So basically, you will have to manage reference count of everything which has been pointed to by P and Q whenever you do this assignment. Okay? And reference counts are used when pointers are, do not appear in cycle. If pointers appear in cycle, I mean that reference count doesn't mean anything. Okay? But if pointers don't appear in cycles, then reference count is the one which can immediately tell me whether something is being used in this. Okay? So what are what is the marking technique I use? So marking technique is now basically automatic deallocation of a block. Okay? So what we have to do is, now suppose your program is executing and you say that I want to find out whether certain blocks are reachable or not. Okay? Then if two processes are running simultaneously, this can become a nightmare because I am continuously allocating and deallocating and the other process is trying to find out, other thread is trying to find out whether certain block is in use or not. Okay? So this cannot go on. The first thing that happens is that you have to suspend execution of the user program. In fact, if any one of you has done list programming or have done programming <coughs> in using some kind of interactive development environment of a language where garbage collection happens automatically, then you will notice that you are editing your program, your program is executing and suddenly everything stops. And then you're for one minute you are just waiting, nothing happens. Okay? So basically it's the garbage collector which is running in the background and your process has been one which has been suspended. Because if you want to find out what are the pointers in use, you cannot simultaneously modify your pointers and say find out what are the pointers in use. Okay? That will give you all the incorrect results. So suspend execution of the user program and then whatever pointers are frozen pointers, then you determine what are the blocks which are currently in use. Okay? And this is the approach which requires knowledge of all the pointers, but we have seen the structure where all the pointers are going to be kept separately. Now go through the heap where you start marking all the blocks which are unused and once you have done that then follow pointers which mark the block as used and that is reachable. So first block will always be reachable, I mark that as used and then deallocate a block which is still marked unused. Right? So I start with the first block, the first used block and say that take pointers from here and continue marking. Okay? And compaction is then move all the used blocks to the end of E. Okay, so this is B fragmentation is and pointers, all the pointers will now have to be adjusted. Okay? Since I know the locations of all the pointers now and what it is pointing to, then movement will now become easier. 
Okay, I'll not have to worry about user area, but I need to only look at the compass. That is how I do my compaction. So, if you know your layout of the space, that what my pointers are, then I can do it. Otherwise, I'll not do it. Right? Okay. So, this is where we'll close up our discussion on code uh, management of E, and we'll now get into the actual code generation, which is looking at the final machine code, okay. and that we start. <laughs>